They were a couple chasing the American dream. She sacrificed a lot. She gave a lot. He wanted to be part of the United States. He wanted to raise his family here. They seemed like a perfect couple, perfect marriage. But a fun night out in Sin City brings their idyllic romance to a horrific end. They saw a Hispanic female woman who was covered in blood, holding a hatchet. He was almost decapitated. An unbelievable, terrible, gruesome, grisly scene. To get to the truth, investigators must unravel a tangled web of lies and infidelity. We realized uh, there was a lot more that we were dealing with. They have to figure out who's telling the truth. Ultimately uncovering a savage plot by killers no one expected. It's shocking. It's sick. How could this be? His words were, I do what I told. What would drive somebody to do this sort of thing? You can't prevent evil. That's the bottom line. You cannot prevent evil. Las Vegas, Nevada. It's Memorial Day in this lively desert oasis. But on the west side of the valley, miles from the strip, Las Vegas police receive an alarming phone call from local resident Georgian Lee. I awoke at two in the morning to noise, to arguing. She was living in a pretty nice neighborhood. Here's some sort of commotion, some sort of fight happening outside her window. She had heard voices, but she didn't actually see the occurrence happen. She claimed that it sounded like voices of two males and that she had heard a female scream. I couldn't understand what they were saying. It was garbled. It was a struggling sound and there was gurgling. And I'm thinking, uh oh, she is being choked or, or raped. Something's going on. And I saw a young man laying in the middle of the street in a pool of blood. So much blood. A female was over him, and her arms were outstretched. And my first thought was, oh, it was a hit and run. So I called the police. Officers and medical personnel immediately head to the scene. Once patrol officers arrive, they discover a scene that was pretty horrific. They come upon, in the middle of this pretty nice street, this woman, hysterical, covered in blood, blood everywhere. And she is understandably freaking out. She was pulling a hatchet next to a male who was uh, lying in the street with an enormous amount of blood around him and who appeared to be deceased. As officers approach, the woman drops the weapon and says that her name is Maria Hernandez and the dead man on the ground is her husband, 43-year-old Enrique Hernandez. We were trying to get control and understand what exactly was occurring and what had happened. Obviously, the first person we wanted to talk to was Maria, and that's what we did. She said this unknown attacker had come out from a, a vacant desert lot, comes up and attacks him with the hatchet. This is very shocking. It's like something out of a movie. Growing up in Veracruz, Mexico, Enrique Hernandez learned the value of hard work from an early age. It's hard work. You have to get up before the break of dawn and you don't get home until the sun has gone down. So you are in humidity. You're working in sometimes 103 degrees with 50% humidity. But even though Enrique always put work first, he still made time for fun. Jugamos fútbol en México. Nuestro equipo de fútbol siempre íbamos a jugar, íbamos a los bailes, a muchos lugares de para diversión. Desde que estábamos en la escuela, en la primaria, eh, salía mucho en bailable en la escuela. Y ahí de ahí el día, desde gustó mucho. Enrique loved his homeland, he saw his future elsewhere. He wanted to live the American dream, to come here as an immigrant, work his butt off, and eventually own some sort of business. He wanted to 
be that person instead of just an employee or just a farm worker, you know, that has to work 12 hours a day in the hot sun. As soon as he was old enough, Enrique moved from Mexico to the United States. His brother followed suit, and the two found work in Central California. That's what's the valley. It's mostly agriculture. That's where a lot of the fruit, vegetables that we get is from there. Nosotros trabajamos en Fresno, Perfil. Yo cuando llegué aquí, la portada durazno, manzana. Then, one day at work in 1997, Enrique noticed a beautiful young woman, 15-year-old Maria Olga Gutierrez. Enrique was working in one of the fields, and Maria's father sold tamales to the field workers. And it just so happened that she was with her father that day, and Enrique goes to the food truck, and, you know, there's this wonderful young woman, and he's smitten. Maria caught his eye and fell in love with her. She was very polite, would say hi to everybody and greet everybody. Born and raised in California, Maria had a caring spirit that Enrique was immediately drawn to. Maria came from a large family. She had several brothers and sisters. She grew up fairly isolated. There was a troubled home life. I think she was looking, but you know, hoping to be saved. I definitely think Maria was excited and grateful for Enrique. The family environment that she was in was not a good one. She wanted out of the house, and she saw Enrique as that ticket. Siempre pensé que estaba enamorado, que había escogido la mujer que él quería. They've been dating, seeing each other for a year and a half, a couple of years. She at the time is 17, he's about 27. 10 years is a pretty decent gap. But her family and that culture as well see him very much as a provider, someone who can provide for her. Can Applied to become a U.S. citizen. 
it seemed that finally after chasing work and chasing some stability for his entire life, that they finally had found a place where they could settle down. I mean, that's the American dream. Sadly, Enrique's American dream comes to a sudden halt as his bloody body lies on a suburban Las Vegas street. He was pronounced at the scene as he was nearly decapitated. Officers turn to his shaken wife, Maria, to find out what happened. So they get her calmed down enough that they get a quick statement from her. They were here because of a, of a quinceañera and that uh, they left their children out so that they could be alone and spend a great night together. She explained to police that her and her husband had some car trouble. They had pulled their vehicle over. Her husband had gotten out of the vehicle to check to see what the engine trouble was. She claimed that a assailant came out of the desert with his hatchet and started attacking her husband. She says he then jumps in the van and drives off with their van, leaving Maria there with her husband covered in blood. An unbelievable, terrible, gruesome, grisly scene. The Las Vegas Police Department clearly is concerned. They don't want to have somebody who's hiding in the bushes in the neighborhoods with an axe in his hand getting ready to attack innocent victims. Coming up, a massive manhunt begins. Every law enforcement officer is starting to look for this particular van. And pressure to catch a killer builds. They have a murderer on the loose in their city who's willing to kill people just for a quick ride. If he was willing to do that, he's willing to kill again. We need to, to identify that person as fast as possible. In the early morning hours of May 25th, 2015, Detectives with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police are investigating the gruesome homicide of 43-year-old Enrique Hernandez after he was attacked by a stranger with a hatchet. He was completely hacked to death. He was almost decapitated. His uh, head was uh, only being held on to the rest of his torso with just a few ligaments left. Enrique had been viciously attacked. However, there were defensive wounds. Enrique fought back. And the hardest thing is that Enrique fought for his life. And ultimately, he couldn't win that. It's not that normal for somebody to be attacked in that type of manner, and then ultimately their car to be taken, specifically in the area of town that they were in. Detectives want to hear firsthand from Enrique's wife, Maria, about the events leading up to the attack. Maria was interviewed. We wanted to get her side of the story as fast as we could, primarily because... If there truly was a, a stranger out there that committed this heinous act, and we needed to identify that person as fast as possible. Like she told first responders, Maria says she and her husband were visiting family from out of town. They're coming for one of his brother's um, daughter's 15th birthday, a quinceañera. It's something big, celebration of a girl's 15th birthday becoming a woman. That's like attending a wedding, for lack of a better description. The whole family had been there. Maria says that last night, they dropped the kids off at Enrique's cousin's house, and she and Enrique went out dancing at a bar on the east side of Las Vegas. Maria had stated that her and her husband had a great night. They were getting along very well. They were dancing together. They were having drinks. Finally left that bar about uh, 2 a.m. in the van, driving through town. Maria was driving the van. Enrique was in the front passenger seat, and they had gotten lost. And... While they were driving, they were having car trouble. Maria says they didn't get far before she smelled something burning. So they have to pull out to the side of the road and figure out what's going on. She told us that she had told him that she felt more comfortable if they went to a gas station because it was more lit, and he felt that everything was okay in the area that they were. She said that she got out of the vehicle with him. They popped the hood. She used her cell phone as a flashlight so that he could see under the hood. While they were looking down in, into the engine compartment is when the attack occurred. Maria says it happened really quick. It was so shocking. He came out of nowhere. It was a blur. All I know is he was an African-American man. So that's all police have to go on. An African-American man somewhere in Las Vegas, driving this van and willing to kill people. According to Maria, the attack 
attacker drove south on Buffalo Drive, leaving Enrique for dead. They put an out on him, be on the lookout, had units flood the area, start searching for someone, and the investigation begins immediately. So every law enforcement officer, including officers in North Las Vegas and Anderson, were starting to look for this particular van. While a manhunt begins, investigators scour the crime scene for evidence. The hatchet that was found at the crime scene, it was consistent with the injuries on the victim, Enrique. There was a pair of high heel shoes that ultimately we learned belonged to Maria. Uh, there was also a pair of glasses that didn't belong to Maria, nor did they belong to Enrique. We also found footprint impressions in blood that didn't match Maria's, nor did they match Enrique's. It was somebody who had left the scene uh, that was there, and that was potentially our suspect. Investigators also search the vacant lot just north of the crime scene. Maria had told us that this black male adult, this unknown black male adult, had come out from a vacant desert lot. The area where the, the crime scene was, uh, just to the north of where Enrique's body was, there was a desert lot. And she said that this person came out from that lot. We canvassed that area. We actually did a grid search to find anything as far as evidence. We found nothing. The more police survey the scene, the more trouble they have believing this was a random attack. We noticed that it didn't look what we believed to be the occurrence that was being explained to us. This was just a residential area where uh, you wouldn't normally uh, anticipate seeing a stranger uh, out there to case somebody for a robbery and a carjacking. So we were very skeptical. The plausibility of a male coming out of a dark desert area with a hatchet and then suddenly attacking somebody just did not seem very plausible. The area is not known for a high crime area, especially not violent crime. It is not on a major crossroads of any public transportation, so that does not seem to be a plausible story. The brutality of the attack also gives detectives pause. For somebody to use an axe or a hatchet on a fellow living human being goes to show how personal it is. The significant anger, the hatred, the true evilness that went into this murder, they wanted somebody to be dead and to suffer. This seemed to be something personal. This wasn't something that was that random. However, working homicide investigations, you have to be open-minded, and you have to let the evidence and the facts of what you learned take you where you need to go. You look at victimology, you look at uh, the victim, and see those connected to the victim to try to figure out who could have done this or why. Before investigators get a chance to dig deeper into Enrique's history, police searching the area get a sudden break in the case. The van was discovered some miles away. And when officers found that van, they discovered that there was blood inside the van. There was blood on the hand on the outside of the van as well. There was a buck knife that was found under the front seat. But it's what's on the street surrounding the van that intrigues officers the most. They discovered something very interesting. The first responding officer looked down and started seeing a trail of blood. What they find is a trail of blood leading from the driver's side door. And so they start to follow this trail of blood like breadcrumbs through a forest. And they go a block, and it keeps going. They go another block, and it keeps going. Another block, and another block. And it goes on for a half mile. The blood trail was followed through the streets and then ultimately ended. It just ended. So right now what we're thinking is, do we have an injured suspect? Coming up, a new discovery leads police down a startling path. He claimed that he was a victim of a robbery and that he had been stabbed. Coincidence or not, we had to look and see. And a hidden motive comes to the surface. This couple had had problems. There had been infidelity. We determined that there was more to the story. After the brutal homicide of 43-year-old Enrique Hernandez, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police have discovered the van that was stolen and abandoned by the killer. They were looking for somebody that clearly got injured because of the fact that there was a blood trail. Then, of course, seeing a knife there certainly added to the question of how was that knife used. The police department did not know exactly what was going on, but they knew that it was a bloody scene. 
Suspecting the killer might have sought medical attention, officers reach out to area hospitals. Ultimately, we got a break. And that break was uh, from one of the hospitals. We got a call that a Hispanic male had showed up. He was transported from a residence from across the valley with a stab wound to the abdomen. And the person that claimed to have been stabbed was Hector Gutierrez. Hector Gutierrez claimed that he was a victim of a robbery and that he had been stabbed by his assailant. With a little digging, police learn that Hector Gutierrez has a connection to the Hernandez family. Who's the biological brother of Maria? Could Hector be involved in Enrique's murder? Or was he the second victim of someone with a vendetta against this family? Coincidence or not, we had to look and see. It was something that we knew had to be followed up and had to be followed up immediately. While one team of investigators heads to the hospital to speak with Hector, a second team reaches out to Enrique's family in the nearby suburb of Henderson to deliver the tragic news. It's shocking. It's sick. It just makes you wonder, how could this be? I don't know. It's just too many things to think about. Enrique's brother, Danielle, is particularly devastated by the news. <laughs> Investigators ask Danielle if he knows anyone who would want to hurt Enrique, but no one comes to mind. Él era bien alegre y bien amistoso con todos. Tenía muchas amistades. When detectives ask about Maria's brother, 22-year-old Hector Gutierrez, Enrique's family confirms that he was also in town for the quinceanera and was staying with another relative in North Las Vegas. Hector Gutierrez is the baby brother of Maria. In many ways, Hector was actually raised by Maria. He was one of the younger ones of the family as far as the siblings went. He struggled. There was an accident that took place in Visalia, California, several years prior to this incident. Hector was driving a vehicle with his mother in, and there was a car accident, and ultimately it took the life of his mother. I think he carried that weight on his shoulder for a long time. But that's not the only burden Hector's been carrying. Hector was having a difficulty in his own identity. Hector had decided that he wanted to have his gender reassigned. Yeah, at some point, Hector decided he wanted to transition into uh, being a woman. While Hector planned his transition, Maria had vowed to help her brother in any way she could. Maria kind of came to her brother's aid, even from a long distance, and told him that she was there to support him, that she would help him. Maria was just this incredible, loving constant for Hector. Maria was someone that he could count on. Hector did treat her as a motherly type figure. She was a protector of, of Hector's. Maria did provide some financial assistance over time, and they remained close. From what police learn, it doesn't appear that Hector would have any motive to hurt Enrique. That is, until family members reveal that Enrique's marriage to Maria wasn't as rosy as she had let on. Police find out that this couple had had problems that there had been infidelity. Maria had cheated on Enrique. Me dijo que, que había fallado la señora en, en su papel, no sé, felicidad, algo así, eh, y este, y que, se, que la había encontrado en malos pasos y que se había ido con fulano, con persona, y entonces pues ese se sentía mal. We believe that the relationship was at least three or four months. There might have been a little bit of time in between that, but the relationship actually became uh, intimate within about three or four months prior to this murder happening. Despite Maria's betrayal, Enrique's family believes he had been trying to save his marriage. Enrique grew up Catholic and then converted to Mormonism. And in both those religions, divorce is just not a thing not an option, wasn't going to happen. So he somehow has to reconcile all that. He has to figure out what to do. I guess they were trying to make it work to get back together. And to me, my thought was, well, everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect. So I thought they were just trying to make it work because they seemed like the perfect family. 
In fact, they were using this quinceanera as a reason to try to reconnect and to get together back uh, as husband and wife and uh, doing it for the sake of the children. Investigators learn that Maria's former lover lives in their hometown of Burley, Idaho. He certainly would have had a motive, arguably, for perhaps losing his girlfriend back to her husband, and so the police wanted to check into his story. We're like, we need to find that guy, because there's a motive, there's a reason. So where's this boyfriend? Coming up, police track down Maria's lover. The story is that she'd been in this troubled relationship for years, and she said that she needed help. And a shocking admission unveils a deadly conspiracy. They immediately started crumbling. We asked him what he meant by get rid of him. He said, kill him. Detectives certainly want to know, perhaps, is this boyfriend possibly a suspect? They track him down pretty quick, but they figure out that he's still up in Idaho. He was potentially a suspect in this murder, someone they're trying to find, and he has an airtight alibi. He's in Idaho, 10-hour drive. There's no way he could have gotten down to Vegas and been involved in this crime, in this murder. There is no indication whatsoever that this boyfriend had anything to do with this homicide of Enrique. Police immediately ruled him out as a suspect. Investigators now turn their full attention to Maria's brother, Hector Gutierrez, who is recovering from a stab wound to his abdomen at a local hospital. I sent detectives uh, to the hospital to, to talk with Hector to find out what his story was. Hector tells police that he had been at a local bar the night before, only to find that his car wouldn't start. So he decided to walk to his cousin's house where he had been staying. He wanted to go on a long walk because he wanted to get some exercise. This was early, early in the morning hours. He began to stroll along the streets of Las Vegas in an area that he didn't even know. Ultimately, he said he was attacked by some men, two or three, he wasn't sure and that they pushed him to the ground and they stole his wallet and they stole his money and they took off. He said in the process of fighting off this robbery, he got stabbed. Hector claimed he had called his eldest sibling to come pick him up on the streets of Las Vegas and bring him to the hospital. But as detectives' questions get more pointed, Hector struggles to provide detailed answers. He couldn't give officers an exact location of where this purported robbery had occurred, so they didn't know even where to start. We couldn't even send uh, police officers to a scene because we didn't know where the scene really was. While they're at the hospital questioning Hector, investigators get word of a critical new clue. Police records reveal that a Las Vegas patrolman had pulled over the Hernandez's van not long before the homicide occurred. We found that there was a record that the van had been stopped about an hour prior, and that that police officer was still on duty, and we'd actually talked with the police officer, and he told us what occurred during the course of the traffic stop. The reason why they got pulled over is that they left without their headlights on, and so the officer pulled them over under suspicion of perhaps being under the influence. He determined that they were not intoxicated to where he felt that Maria was capable of driving the vehicle and that she could drive away. He did identify Maria via her driver's license as well as he identified Enrique. But what the officer reveals next changes the course of the investigation. It seems a third passenger was along for the ride. The description of what the officer said compared to what was at the hospital, we knew that person was Hector Gutierrez. It's a big deal because Maria never told us that anybody else was in the van, even when she was asked. And it puts the three together in this van right before the murder. The pieces are starting to fall together for investigators, and Hector's story is falling apart. Following up on their suspicion, detectives obtain Hector's shoes and discover they're a match to the bloody prints left at the scene. When confronted with the evidence, Hector finally comes clean. He 
started admitting to the fact that he had been up at the homicide scene, that he was in the van, and that he played a major role in his brother-in-law's death. But Hector insists that killing Enrique wasn't his idea. He claimed that he had been pressured by his sister Maria to do this act. This was Maria's idea and to utilize her brother, uh, Hector, uh, to carry it out. According to Hector, it all started when his sister called him crying. Over the course of two or three months, his sister, Maria, had been telling him of how she felt she was being mistreated by her husband. Maria admitted that she had been unfaithful to her husband. She was afraid that Enrique was going to commit some type of violent act on her boyfriend. She indicated that she had been under a lot of stress and a lot of uh, violence that she had sustained on the hands of Enrique, and that's one of the reasons why she found a lover. Hector's story is that she'd been in this troubled relationship for years, and she said that she needed help, that she was desperate. She bought him a plane ticket to come down to Vegas to help her with her problem. When pressed a little bit more about how that abuse was taking place, he really couldn't give us anything substantiated as far as whether that was a uh, physical or emotional or even sexual. But he said that his sister had told him that she was being abused and that she wanted to, quote, get rid of him. We asked him what he meant by get rid of him. He said, kill him. Hector did not have a nasty bone in his body that he really would be willing and saying, hey, let me do this for you, sis. He needed to be conjoled and, uh, and pushed into this. Maria reminded him about the horrible thing that had happened with their mom. She said that family needed to stick together. This is all what you have. Family has to do these things for family. The way that at least Hector explained it was that he would do what he was told to do from his elders. That meant his sisters or anybody in his family, his siblings. And his words were, I do what I told. He felt obligated to help her because she was the most supportive to him. And they were really, really close. But I guess that's what he felt obligated to help his sister. She ultimately wired Hector $800 for him to leave California, come to Las Vegas for the weekend during the quinceanera. She wanted him to have a sister in her murderous plan that she had already concocted in her mind. And it was ultimately Hector, through a heavy conscience, told us what actually occurred. Hector tells police that Maria had planned for the three of them to go out to a local bar the night after the family celebration. Enrique was dancing with Maria. There was not a lot of alcohol consumed, but Enrique clearly was the one who had consumed a little bit more than Maria, and so that's why Maria had become the designated driver. Maria had secreted the hatchet that he was supposed to use on his brother-in-law and had placed it under the seat. She actually got the hatchet in Idaho and placed it in a car. So that hatchet traveled all the way from Burley, Idaho, down to Las Vegas with her husband sitting in the car, not realizing that his murder weapon was uh, being transported by him. They then all left uh, together in the van with Hector sitting in the back. They drove away from the place that they were attending and crossed Las Vegas Boulevard on Tropicana, where they actually got pulled over by a patrol officer. Following their traffic stop, Maria had driven the van to a dark part of town where she put the next phase of her plan into action. At that point, she started feigning that she had engine problems. And then she pulled over and asked her husband, Enrique, can you look under the hood to see what's wrong with the car? Enrique gets out of the vehicle. Maria gets out of the vehicle with them. They open up the hood. Enrique then tells her to try to start the vehicle back up. She gets back in the vehicle and then tells Hector, go, do it now, go. At that point, Hector decided it was the point of no return. Reached down to where the hatchet had been secreted by Maria. He got out of the van. He walked around, got behind his brother-in-law, Enrique, who was looking over in the engine, and suddenly picked that hatchet up, held it over his head, and then came crashing down with the blade, striking Enrique's neck area. That's when Enrique realizes he's being attacked. Pulls his own knife, a buck knife, actually, from his pocket and tries to defend himself, ultimately stabbing Hector. But Hector claims that Maria didn't just witness the attack. She was an active participant in her husband's murder. Maria actually grabbed, reached out and grabbed the arms of her husband, trying to hold him back so that uh, her brother could continue to give the fatal blows. 
Hector tells us that there was no possible way that he felt that without Maria's help, he would have been able to overpower Enrique. He said it was because of Maria, he was able to get Enrique down to the ground and ultimately hatch him to death. She is a cold-hearted murderer, four feet eight of pure evil. Coming up, police confront Maria with her brother's shocking accusation. Her stories continue to change. She said that her brother may have done this out of love for her. Nobody really saw this coming. In Las Vegas, Nevada, 22-year-old Hector Gutierrez has just confessed to his role in the savage murder of his brother-in-law, Enrique Hernandez. We were finally able to determine that uh, Hector wasn't robbed, and Hector sustained his injuries uh, due to the attack that he and his sister conducted on Enrique. Hector was in the hospital until he was patched up. He was immediately arrested under suspicion of having committed murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Detectives work quickly to bring in Hector's sister, Maria. Once in custody, Maria tries to stick with her original story of a hatchet-wielding stranger that carjacked them. The detectives confront Maria, and they start presenting her with some conflicting information that they learned from her brother. Through the course of time that, that detectives did talk to her, her stories continue to change. Maria admits that the carjacking story was a total fabrication. It was a lie. Maria tries to convince detectives that she had nothing to do with the murder and that her brother Hector had attacked Enrique on his own. She told us that she never used the word kill him. She said that her brother Hector was upset with Enrique because of the way he had been treating her. She said that Enrique had been an abusive husband, that he had not been a good faithful husband himself that she had some problems in a relationship and that her brother may have done this out of love for her. We felt that some were half-truths and some were just bold-faced lies. We attempted to try to substantiate anything that Maria told us. We were never able to substantiate that she was in fact an abused wife. Law enforcement just did not believe that Hector did this all completely on his own, that it just so happens that the hatchet was there and that he would act in a way that really just did not seem plausible because she already gave a fake story to the first one. Now she's given a second version. We believed it was Maria who helped Hector hold Enrique now because Enrique was fighting back and she actually held his arms down while her brother, at her direction, Hector, hatcheted him to death. In addition to that, they thought that she was probably the mastermind behind this whole horrific murder. Maria and her brother are both charged with conspiracy to commit murder and murder in the first degree with use of a deadly weapon. It's unbelievable that this woman, this mother of four from a small rural town, had her husband killed in such a gruesome and grisly way. I don't think anybody within the family on both sides, nobody really saw this coming. How could you do that to someone you love? How could you do that to the father of your children? So you have to figure out what the story is, what would drive somebody with no criminal record, who described as a decent mother, what would drive somebody to do this sort of thing? As prosecutors prepare for trial, they make a discovery that suggests Maria's true motive for wanting her husband dead. I did some investigation. I checked to see if Enrique had any type of uh, substantial life insurance. Did not find any of that. I think what it really came down to it is this her sense of family. Enrique found out about the affair and was beyond upset. Threatened to take the four kids with him and take them away from Maria. That's what made Maria snap. She would be removed from her children. In Maria's mind, that was a line that he did not cross. Having him dead and out of the picture was a lot easier than uh, stressing and worrying about losing her children. And when the time came that she needed help, she knew exactly the right person that she could manipulate into doing this horrific murder. Finally, in January of 2017, they reach a deal and they both plead guilty. It was an agreement by the state that they wouldn't seek life in prison. Hector had a term 
of 20 years to 50 years on the murder. As for Maria, she receives a sentence of 25 to 70 years for her role in the crime. Maria had sent Hector the money. Maria had come up with a plan. It was Maria that put things in motion. That's why her case resolved for a little more time than what Hector's did, even though Hector was the actual person who did the killing. Although there is justice for Enrique, his loss will forever be felt by his friends and family. Siento que ya no está conmigo. Pues me duele mucho que ya no está y lo que pasó que fue inesperado, increíble lo que pasó. Pues siempre me quedó la duda de por qué hizo eso. O sea, fue una cosa inesperada de que hay veces que ni lo creo que de lo que le hice a mi hermano, o sea, cosas sin explicaciones. Why did she not think about her family? Well, still it's hard to believe. She didn't think about her family that she was hurting. It's those children at the end of the day who ultimately pay. Those four children that belong to Maria and Enrique. They'll never see their father again. And they'll only see their mother behind bars if they ever choose to do so. on Snapped, go to Oxygen.com. A Manhattan financier and his beautiful wife lived the high life among New York's elite. They had a couple of addresses in Manhattan, uh, one on Park Avenue. They also had a home in the Hamptons. We lived a very nice life, but we lived it respectfully. With an Ivy League pedigree and a head for business, their handsome son was also destined for New York's upper crust. He was a ladies' man. He was incredibly good looking. He tried to start a business of his own. But a darkness is about to consume their whole family. What's the emergency today, ma'am? Um, my husband is, I think, dead. Mr. Gilbert was laying on the floor with a gunshot wound to his head. I was stunned. I was absolutely shocked. The media frenzy that ensues will engulf all of Manhattan high society. It is a murder sending ripples through a quiet, upscale Manhattan neighborhood. You're finding out that they're one of these little rich kids with the entitlement issue. We've got money and power and privilege and murder. But it's what the cameras don't see that reveals the truth behind this Prince of Manhattan's fall from grace. I thought, oh, you're far sicker than we ever knew. If you have an adult child who's suffering with mental illness, it is very difficult to force that person to see doctors and take their medication. What happened to our family should never, ever happen to any other family again in this country. Life in the high rises of Midtown is more refined. When you move into one of these neighborhoods in Manhattan, you don't just sign on the dotted line and move in. You have to pass background checks. They have old money more than they have new money. But the key factor is they have money. Just after 3 p.m. on January 4th, 2015, an unusual call comes in to 911 from 67-year-old resident Shelly Gilbert. What's the emergency today, ma'am? Um, my husband is, I think, dead. Okay. Please run. Connected to EMS. Do not hang up, okay? Thank you. Okay. We knew that the victim was Thomas Gilbert, a male in his 60s. Uh, the caller was his wife, Shelly. He's not breathing. What? I don't think so. I can't get a pulse. I think he's been dead. He's been shot. Yes. Minutes later, first responders enter the apartment. We saw the wife at the time, Shelly. She was very distraught, very upset. Shelly directs police to the couple's bedroom. When investigators initially arrived on the scene, it had the look of a suicide. 
Mr. Gilbert was laying on the floor with a gunshot wound to his head. The gun was in his hand, which is a little strange because you would figure if he hit the ground, uh, the gun would probably be released from his grip and it would be on the ground, which it wasn't. Investigators immediately honed in on the fact that it was odd for someone who allegedly committed suicide to still be holding on to the gun. We could rule out a suicide at this point, but your mind starts working and thinking, I mean, what happened? Was it a burglary? Was it a robbery? In the next room, Thomas's shaken wife, Shelly, is also processing the devastating scene. I was stunned. I was absolutely shocked. I just remember trying to get through minute to minute. Mrs. Gilbert's with a couple of detectives asking questions, and you just keep on going until you find out all the facts. Born in 1945, Thomas Gilbert seemed destined for success from a young age. He was born into a very upper-class, white-collar family. He didn't want for anything while he was growing up. He attended Andover College, and then he graduated from Princeton in 1966. In the late 70s, Thomas was an up-and-coming Wall Street big shot when he met beautiful Shelley Ray. I met Tom at my favorite dance in New York. He called the following Tuesday. We went to a discotheque called the Hippopotamus for drinks. Three quarters of the way through the evening, I wanted to give him a shake and say, where have you been all these years? She was a debutante, and they moved in the same circles of high society New York. And they married in 1981. They were a beautiful couple. They seemed to be madly in love. By the early 80s, Thomas and Shelley were comfortably established in their roles amongst New York's upper crust. Thomas worked on Wall Street, and Shelley Gilbert was assistant vice president at New Court Securities Corporation. They later moved to the Upper East Side. They also had a home in the Hamptons. They had it pretty well. Memberships to various clubs. They were pretty much socialites in the area and had a lot of friends and were well-respected people in the community. Three years into their marriage, Thomas and Shelley welcomed a baby boy. Tommy was born in 1984, and we were ecstatic. After paternity leave, I went back to work for a year, and I missed him dreadfully. So I became a full-time mother. The Gilberts had two children, Tommy, and they also had a, a daughter. We were ready to have children and loved it, absolutely loved every bit of parenting. When it was time for their son to attend college, Tommy followed in his father's footsteps by attending Princeton. While he was at Princeton, he was taking an economics course that he absolutely adored. With dashing good looks, Tommy stood out among his wealthy, pedigreed peers. He was quite tall. I think he's about 6'3", very, very fit, blonde, very model-looking. Uh, he dressed very casually. In 2009, Tommy graduated from Princeton with a degree in economics. Thomas Gilbert Sr. really wanted his son, his namesake, to follow in his footsteps, to carry on the family name and pursue a job on Wall Street. But Tommy, like his father, wanted to chart his own path. He tried to start a business of his own using technical charts to predict market action. He went through a legal process to establish his company. He did some work for my husband in my husband's business, and my husband paid him for it whenever he could. Still, Tommy had to rely on his parents to stay afloat in expensive Manhattan. Thomas's Chelsea apartment was $2,400 a month. Thomas's parents paid for his apartment, and they also gave him an allowance of $1,000 a week. With the generous cash influx of over $6,000 a month from his parents, Tommy had time to work and play the field. Tall, blonde, and destined for big things, Tommy never had a hard time finding a date. After college, Tommy started dating a socialite named Lizzie Frazier. The two of them together were beautiful and a stunning pair out on the New York social scene. After their relationship fizzled, Tommy began a fling with publicist Anna Rothschild in December of 2013. I did think he was very handsome, that's for sure. He told me that he worked for his dad for a time, but so I got the feeling that he was just trying to do something to make his dad proud. 
While his son dated gorgeous women and tried to build a reputation in the business world, Tommy Sr. was hard at work on a new venture of his own. After 40 years on Wall Street, he started his own hedge fund, Wainscott Capital. Tom was starting a business, but it wasn't quite there yet. Um, but it showed every sign of doing extremely well. The Gilbert family seemed bound for continued wealth and success. Until one tragic January afternoon. We had received the call that there was a person shot at the Beekman apartment complex. Thomas Gilbert Sr. has been murdered. The weapon was laying on his chest and his hand was placed over the weapon. What it appears to be is a bungled attempt to make it look like a suicide. After ruling out suicide, detectives are also able to quickly eliminate the possibility of a random attack. Either you're getting buzzed in or you have a key, so we know that. We also know that there was no breaking at the front door of the Gilbert home as well, so we knew that it wasn't a burglary. But who targeted this wealthy businessman? By this point, the neighborhood is aware that Thomas Gilbert Sr. has been murdered, and everyone is concerned. Is there a killer on the loose that could come for them next? Coming up, Shelley Gilbert relives the worst day of her life. This is horrific, and I'm not sure I'll ever believe it happened. I was terrified. And a citywide manhunt becomes front page news. We have a shell casing envelope with the serial number of the gun that was recovered at the crime scene. Let's get the person that did this as fast as we can. All my friends were telling me, get out of your apartment. I was so scared. success. It was good for his portfolio. So I was thrilled. Is it not every father's dream to have their son follow in their footsteps whenever that's possible? But that dream came to an abrupt end on the afternoon of January 4th when Shelley Gilbert found her husband dead inside their Manhattan apartment. This is horrific and I'm not sure I'll ever believe it happened. I was terrified. Mr. Gilbert is laying on his back. He had one gunshot wound to his head, which was the cause of death. The gun was a 40 Glock. There was a spent round found at the scene, as well as the casing. To piece it all together, investigators turned to the woman who'd made the 911 call, Thomas's wife, Shelley. The odd thing is that Shelley's tone of voice on the call was rather calm. I mean, let's face it, whenever there's a spouse who is met with some sort of horrible death, they always look to the husband or the wife. In her interview with police, Shelley explains that around 3 o'clock that afternoon, their 30-year-old son, Tommy, had paid an unexpected visit. He came in unannounced. I was surprised to see him, thrilled to have him come by. He told me he wanted to see Tom to discuss business. On his way to talk with his father, Shelley says Tommy asked her for a favor. I thought, this is good news. He's really doing well. He wants to work with Tom. That's terrific. He asked me to go out and get a sandwich and Coke, and I did. And that was that. He and his dad were going to have a conversation relative to some financial things, and he had some plans that he wanted to go into with his dad. That's when Thomas went into the room to speak to his dad. Shelley leaves the house, and... Call it a mother's intuition, call it what you will. But a few minutes later, she gets what she describes as a bad feeling. She turns around and goes back to her apartment. I came back right away. There was something about it that was concerning, so I came right back. I didn't get a sandwich. Shelley tells detectives that as soon as she entered the apartment, her stomach sank. She is most notably struck by what she calls a deafening silence when she walks in. I was expecting to hear conversation when I listened at the door. I heard nothing, and I was concerned about that. She goes to the back bedroom and immediately sees her husband on the floor. My first thought when I saw Tom was, 
Oh, you're knocked out. You must have gotten into a fisticuff. Shelly says she quickly realized the situation was much worse. She sees her husband on the floor with a bullet hole to the side of his head, kind of weirdly holding a 40 caliber block. Shelly immediately picks up the phone to call 911, as any wife would do. I remember talking to the nice lady on the other end of the phone. You know, when will they be here? When will they be here? I remember being desperately in need of being with somebody, not being alone. It seemed like a very long time before they came. Shelly tells investigators there's only one person who could have shot Thomas, their son, Tommy Jr. That's the only other person in the apartment. When she leaves, by the time Shelly Gilbert gets back, following her intuition, Tommy's no longer there. I thought, oh, you're far sicker than we ever knew. According to Shelly, Tommy suffers from severe mental illness. He would do things like wash his hands frequently. He would lose things. That seemed to increase, and I realized in retrospect that uh, certain objects became contaminated and he couldn't deal with them. And so that he would just avoid them. And as that became more so, it became obvious what was going on. Thomas was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, and it would show itself sometimes with him believing that things and places and people were contaminated or radioactive. When he last saw his doctor, they were trying to evaluate him for schizophrenia. And which I'm sure he was full on schizophrenia. We wanted to get him help. We were trying to convince him to get help. Shelley tells detectives that their efforts had only pushed Tommy further away. He didn't want to have anything to do with us, and he wouldn't answer texts or phone calls or emails. When we did talk to him, he'd tell us not to try and get in touch with him. As he got sicker and sicker towards the end there, we saw less and less and less of him. We were bashing our heads trying to figure out how to communicate with him more arranging things to keep him busy that we might be able to be part of. As Shelley pours her heart out to detectives, it seems clear to them that she is telling the truth. This poor lady, you feel terrible for her. She lost her husband. In her mind, she thinks her son had some something to do with this. You could pretty much tell at that point, you could eliminate her as being a suspect. Watching her and seeing her demeanor, we knew that she wasn't involved in this. As for Tommy, detectives know they need to act quickly. We're making a prime suspect number one at this point. We have to worry about if Thomas is the alleged perp at this particular point. Okay, does Thomas have another gun on him? You don't want some innocent person being shot. Let's get the person that did this as fast as we can. It is a murder sending ripples through a quiet, upscale Manhattan neighborhood. Nearby, it could be a male white in his early 30s, wearing a dark hooded sweatshirt. Name is Thomas Gilbert Jr. Is he still be in the area? Unknown right now if he's uh, on or not. Coming up, police close in on their suspect. They have no idea what to expect. And alarming new information casts a dark shadow over this once gilded Prince of Manhattan. Neighbors saw someone standing in that cemetery among the tombstones watching the blaze as this house burned to the ground. On January 4th, 2015, Detectives with NYPD's 17th Precinct have launched a manhunt for 30-year-old Tommy Gilbert after his father, 70-year-old Thomas Gilbert Sr., was found shot to death inside his upscale Manhattan apartment. We find out where he lives. We ping his phone. We get a warrant that will know where his, his location is. So we're up on his phone. We're checking if he's using credit cards. We flag the father's credit cards. As the police dragnet intensifies, news of the high-profile shooting sends shockwaves through New York's upper crust. I looked at my messages and people were saying Tommy killed his dad. All my friends were telling me, get out of your apartment. He's going to come there and kill you. I was so scared. Almost six hours pass with no updates. Then detectives finally get a break. 
it was a ping on the phone. Ping meaning that the location. And that location was his residence, his apartment. At 9.30 p.m., law enforcement converge on Tommy's Chelsea apartment building. They have no idea what to expect, right? They don't know if Tommy is still armed and dangerous, if he's alive on the other side of the door. They have no idea. We're waiting out there for a long time, it seemed like. And all of a sudden, who services Thomas? Tommy eventually just sort of casually opens the door while he's casually talking on his phone and lets them know that he's on the phone with his lawyer. He knew the jig was up. I'm sure what he's thinking is, my best bet is to come out. Let me not make this a worse situation. At that point, he's handcuffed and searched, and he's transported back to the 17th precinct. We get back to the 17th precinct, and we put him in an interview room where we were going to interview him. At that point, a lawyer showed up and said, cease and desist all questioning, and we stopped. Tommy may not be talking, but the media is. The press jumped on this immediately. We've got money and power and privilege and murder. This is the kind of stuff journalists really go for. When you have names such as Princeton and the Hamptons attached to your name, it hits the news in a big way. And if Tom and I had been factory workers and living on the outer edges of New York, the press wouldn't have paid any attention to it whatsoever. As the media storm intensifies, NYPD investigators focus in on Tommy's past. Speaking to his closest friends, detectives are stunned to learn that the handsome 30-year-old is the subject of another investigation, this one in nearby Southampton, a vacation haven for the East Coast's wealthy elite. Tommy Gilbert became best friends with a man named Peter Smith. Thomas would often go surfing and spend weekends at Peter's home in the Hamptons where they would hang out. They were really close. However, friends say the relationship soured when Tommy accused Peter of hitting on his ex-girlfriend, the gorgeous socialite Lizzie Frazier. Tommy was, for lack of a better word, infatuated with her. And even after they broke up, Lizzie became a point of contention between Tommy and his one-time best friend, Peter Smith. Tommy accused Peter of wanting to be with Lizzie, even though the relationship was over, and even though Peter denied all of the allegations, that really stuck with Tommy. According to his friends, the tension between Peter and Tommy allegedly boiled over in the fall of 2013. One day, as Peter left his apartment, he was brutally attacked, allegedly by his old BFF, Tommy Gilbert. For whatever reason, Peter decided not to press charges against Thomas. Though Peter never formally pressed charges, he did get lawyers involved. Thomas's friends were concerned about him, but they were also a little afraid. After that, Peter got a restraining order against Thomas. Then, almost a year later, Tommy's friends say a mysterious fire broke out in Peter Smith's Hamptons home. The whole home burns down. Investigators, upon going through the rubble, discover that this was arson. There were neighbors who said that they saw someone standing in that cemetery among the tombstones watching the blaze as this house burned to the ground. And in that cemetery, uh, investigators did find a gasoline can and strips of purple sheets that looked like they were used to accelerate the blaze. Despite Peter's suspicions, Southampton investigators never uncovered definitive proof that Tommy Gilbert was responsible for the blaze. The police were not able to prove anything about that house. If he did it, if he did not, who knows? Thomas Gilbert was never charged or convicted with setting the fire. He was the main person of interest. Now, only four months after the fire, Tommy is back in the crosshairs of law enforcement. To get more information, police sit down with Shelley Gilbert once again. According to Shelley, 
Though her son had suffered from mental illness for over a decade, he worked hard to hide it from those outside the family. He was always putting his best foot forward. So when he got sick, that was very much a part of what he was doing, trying to appear, in that case, normal. And so that made it harder to see. Throughout all of this, his outward appearance is still immaculate. Meanwhile, his apartment is a train wreck. It's the shambles, dirty, everything's out of place. There's a mismatch between his outward appearance and what's really going on behind closed doors. According to Shelley, as the years went by, Tommy became more and more paranoid. His paranoia was that people were out to harm him. And he had various iterations of that that were very real to him. As Tommy's paranoia grew, so did his dependence on his parents. Thomas Gilbert Sr. used to give Junior money. He used to give him $1,000 a week, and he used to pay his rent, which was $2,400. Through it all, Shelley says she and her husband tried desperately to get their son the help he needed. The only way to get somebody into a hospital against them well is to go through the legal process which we were more than willing to do, to have them taken in by the state. But there are so many people that get taken into the state that they are overwhelmed and will keep people typically only for four days. And after four days, one would have a very angry, very mentally ill son on their hands, which is even worse. If you have an adult child who's suffering with mental illness, it is very difficult to force that person to see doctors and take their medication. And that's the trap that the Gilbert family fell into here. Shelley tells police she believes Tommy is so sick that there's no way he could have understood what he did when he put a gun to his father's head. He was capable of doing it, but not understanding the impact and the importance of it. Coming up, Tommy's friends paint a different picture of this playboy's life. He seemed to be in very good spirits two weeks before he had killed his dad. And detectives uncover bad blood between father and son. All of a sudden, his dad is taking some money away from him. He says, in my opinion, sarcastically, I love you. You're wonderful. Now stay the hell away from me. herself at the center of a storm few can imagine. Her husband of 35 years is dead, and her beloved son is under arrest for his murder. I still can't believe that. I still can't believe that is true. Not only am I a grieving widow, but a grieving mother. Shelley believes mental illness is what caused Tommy Gilbert Jr. to shoot his father on January 4th, 2015. He was sicker than we realized, and then he proceeded to get sicker because she wasn't getting any help. As investigators build their case, one question remains. If Tommy was mentally ill, how did he manage to get his hands on the 40 caliber Glock he used to kill his father? You can't get permission to have a firearm permit, a handgun permit, unless you have four people in your life willing to attest that you are mentally fit. Tommy didn't do that. Having confiscated Tommy's computer from his apartment, investigators scrutinize the 30-year-old's emails. They discover that Tommy found the Glock for sale on the internet. So Tommy has a long email exchange with the gun seller where they decide on price and they decide on Tommy getting in the car and driving to Ohio to get the gun because the person selling the gun figured out that it's illegal to just throw a Glock in the mail. In May, when I broke up with him, that week is the week that he went to go buy the gun. To investigators, Tommy's trip to Ohio seems at odds with his mother's portrayal of a young man who had no understanding of his actions. Sounds like it was quite planned that he drove to another state, bought a gun, drove back with it in order to hide it. If the murder was pre-planned and not part of a psychotic break, what was Tommy's motive? We're interviewing everyone we can, anyone that he may have come into contact with. 
friends or family, whatever we could do. It seems Thomas Sr.'s new business venture required him to tighten the reins on his cash flow to Tommy Jr. Thomas's father did not have the funds that he once did at the time of his death. He was in the process of starting a new business venture, and that takes money. As time got a little difficult for Sr., he started to diminish his, his weekly pay. So it went down from 1,000, I believe it went down to 600, I believe it even went down to 300. Through those investigations, you're finding out that he's one of these little rich kids with the entitlement issue, and now all of a sudden his dad is taking some money away from him. Authorities surmise that as the funds dwindled, the tension between Tommy and his dad rose exponentially. It culminates in the months prior to this murder, with Tommy basically sending an email to his father, probably the longest email that he's ever sent to his father, where he says, in my opinion, sarcastically, Hey, Dad, you've been the greatest dad ever. I love you. You're wonderful. Now, stay the hell away from me. I don't want to be your son. If if we cross paths, I want you to cross the street. Don't contact me. Don't email me. Don't talk to me. As evidence mounts, NYPD detectives begin to believe that it was not mental illness, but greed and anger that drove this wealthy Upper East Sider to commit murder. What we started to believe that Thomas Jr. went there and probably had an argument with his dad. Mom went out, that's why he didn't want the mom there. And obviously he had a gun on him. So his intent was to go there and if he didn't get what he wanted, being the spoiled brat he was, he shot him. He panicked. He tried to protect himself and make it look like a suicide, placing the gun in his dad's hand. Tommy Gilbert was charged with second degree murder. He was also charged with two counts of criminal possession of a weapon. He was also charged with uh, criminal possession of ammunition within the New York City limits. As the legal and media storms rise, Shelley Gilbert's frustration mounts. Who wants to hear their child is spoiled and entitled? No, nobody wants to hear that. And it wasn't true. We lived a very nice life. But we lead it respectfully and put our best efforts out. We're not spoiled people. We don't raise spoiled children. Shelley's concerns escalate as Tommy's condition worsens behind bars. I would visit him, and it was horrifying. Sometimes I visited him, and he was remarkably coherent. And sometimes he refused to see me, and I assume those were days he was really having a hard time. So here I was left visiting him, and watching him get sicker and sicker and sicker and not being able to do a thing about it. While he was in prison, Thomas's psychosis seemed to be becoming worse. And he would say that he believed everything around him was contaminated. And he thought that if he touched certain things, he would die. At Shelley's insistence, Tommy's attorneys attempt to take action. Tommy's lawyer wasn't quite sure that Tommy was actually competent to stand trial. Mr. Gilbert was undergoing a severe mental health break. I moved very quickly to have him declared unfit by the court. Coming up, as a courtroom fight rages over Tommy Gilbert's mental competence, his mother stands behind him. How can I shut him out? That can't, that's the question. I can't. It's impossible. He's still Tommy Gilbert. He's just a very diseased Tommy Gilbert. And Tommy's future is determined. You can have mental illness, and you can still be guilty of a crime. In August of 2015, Tommy Gilbert's attorneys moved to have the 31-year-old Ivy Leaguer declared unfit for trial. Defendants have to be able to understand what is going on in the courtroom, what the judge does, what the jury does, what the prosecutor and defense attorney do. He was incapable of that kind of higher level of thought. To prove Tommy is unfit for trial, his attorneys have him evaluated. The first two psychiatrists were from Bellevue Hospital. Two of them did a very thorough analysis and determined that Tommy was not fit for trial. He was contemporaneously evaluated by multiple experienced and independent psychiatrists. They deemed him to be unfit, unequivocally unfit to participate in his defense. Despite the findings of medical professionals, the prosecution attempts to argue otherwise. 
the prosecutors believed that he could participate in his own defense, he could decide strategy for his own defense, he could tell his lawyers what happened, what didn't happen, what's true, what's not, he could be part of the process. While Tommy is held behind bars, judges and mental health professionals debate Tommy's fitness. Then, on November 4th, 2015, 10 months after his arrest, the judge makes a decision. The prosecutors hired a doctor that did rule him to be fit for trial, and the trial proceeded. I was stunned. I was absolutely shocked. He declared him fit for trial. So the system fails everybody. Fails Mrs. Gilbert, fails Mr. Gilbert Sr. and his memory. It fails the defendant. He was completely unfit to participate in these proceedings. In May 2019, after a series of delays, 34-year-old Tommy's trial finally gets underway in a Manhattan courtroom. The media is anxious to get a look at the former New York playboy. He had movie star looks. Fast forward to 2019, and that Tommy Gilbert is disheveled, looks older than his years, weathered, stressed. Over the years, his physical appearance deteriorated completely. And he wasn't even getting enough food to eat. I didn't know it was possible for him to look so pale. He was unrecognizable. It was shocking how thin and pale and different he looked. I wouldn't have recognized him if he were walking down the street. At his trial, Tommy's mental health is once again front and center. Thomas Gilbert ended up pleading not guilty due to reasons of insanity. In order to be found mentally insane, you have to show that you didn't know what you were doing is wrong. On May 28th, Shelley Gilbert takes the stand, determined to prove her son's true mental state at the time of her husband's murder. I wanted the court to understand how very sick he was. I mean, if you brushed up against him with the coat that it was contaminated, he couldn't handle that. It was too, too painful for him, too difficult to process. He'd be very upset. Shelley asserts that Tommy grew to have such feelings about his father as well. He thought his father was controlling the horror show that was going on in his head. And that, I think, was his reasoning for it. But he had no way of comprehending the gravity of it. The money that the press has been talking about had nothing to do with it. Shelley's testimony is powerful. But discussing Tommy's illness in front of her son is a heart-wrenching experience. Here I was talking in depth about very personal things about my son and my perceptions and my husband's perceptions of him, all deeply personal. And he was sitting right there listening to it all. I mean, that's not healthy for him. And it was brutal for me, of course. When it's the prosecution's turn, they allege that Tommy went to his parents' home that day fully aware of his intentions. Tommy Gilbert drove from New York to Ohio to get his hands on that gun. He bought the ammo. He bought a speed loader. Now, fast forward to the day of. What does Tommy do? He shows up at his parents' apartment unannounced, chats with his mother, and then makes sure that she has to leave the apartment because he knows that he's about to kill his father. Tommy specifically said he wanted a sandwich and a Coke. Why is that significant? Because he knew that Shelly never kept Coke in the house. She would actually have to leave the apartment to go do what Tommy wanted. And she did. Prosecutors say it was greed, not mental illness, that caused Tommy to kill his father. When his dad decided to pull back on the money reins, Tommy probably felt very, very threatened. Not just that he was going to be out a few bucks, but that his entire lifestyle might come to a screeching halt. You can have mental illness, and you can still be guilty of a crime. The point of Tommy Gilbert's case was, yes, he was mentally ill, but he wasn't so mentally ill as to get a pass for what he did. The ultimate decision rests with the jury. On June 28th, they return with a verdict. He ended up being convicted of second-degree murder and second-degree criminal possession of a weapon. The judge in this case sentenced Tommy to the maximum she could have sentenced him to, which is 30 years to life. She acknowledged that Tommy is mentally ill, but 
She, like the jury, did not buy that he was legally insane at the time he committed this crime. Though the conviction brings closure to the case, for Shelley Gilbert, the anguish never ends. I wasn't surprised so much it got wrenched. Horrified. Um, I still am. Shelley Gilbert is an example of what unconditional love truly looks like. Her husband is dead. Her son pulled the trigger. But she has been a staunch advocate for Tommy Gilbert. I love Tommy. I hate the disease. If he'd gotten the help he needed, my husband would still be alive today. It's a very sad situation because the Gilbert family has been ripped apart by this, right? Mr. Gilbert Sr., who is a wonderful man, is no longer here. Mrs. Gilbert's left a widow with her only son um, incarcerated. And it's just sad all around. Society as a whole needs to understand this is how we treat our very mentally ill. We need to shine a bright light on it so people understand it. What happened to our family should never, ever happen to any other family again in this country. And it can and should be corrected. information on SNAP, go to Oxygen.com.